Hello, Monetization Nation. Today, I'm joined by Eric Qualman. Eric is a five-time best-selling author and keynote speaker who's performed in more than 55 countries and reached more than 50 million people. He's the host of the popular Super You podcast, and his work has been used by the National Guard, uh, NBC Universal, NASA, and many others. Eric was also voted the second most likable author in the world behind Harry Potter's J.K. Rowling. He's also the author of The Focus Project, which we're going to talk about today. This is a book that is designed to provide solutions to the challenges of focusing in a super unfocused world. Thank you so much for joining us today, Eric. Oh, it's great to be here with you and your audience. So can you share with us something that you are super passionate about? I'm super passionate about my kids. Uh, I've got yeah. two daughters. They're awesome. So I always say I'm trying to live up to being the world's number one dad mug. I know everyone has it. <laughs> my buddy actually has a funny t-shirt. It says average dad. So instead, <laughs> instead of having number one dad, he's got average dad. Um, outside of the kids, outside of work and business and writing, I actually played basketball at Michigan State, so I still follow my coach, Tom Izzo, still there, and then a lot of the assistant coaches were players I played with, so I still keep tabs on Michigan State. Tell us about your journey, your story to become this expert in focusing and in a digital marketing and, and entrepreneurship expert. So I've been in the digital space now 28 years, because I got it early as an intern up in Detroit where I grew up. And from there was at Yahoo back in the 90s when they were kind of the Facebook of the day. And then I was the head of marketing at Travel Zoo. And we took that company from private to public. It was one of the top performing stocks on the NASDAQ. But I wrote a book, Social Nomics, over a decade ago. And then that launched me into a whole different path, which is writing books uh, and speaking around the world. As you mentioned, I've been fortunate to go to so many countries and speak to so many diverse groups and market industries. And I love it because you start to learn from every different vertical and then you have that red thread that goes through all of it. But that's why I landed where I am. And then a lot of you that might see me on video, my name's Eric Quammen. So first initial last name's Equal Man. Uh, and then over time, it just became a thing to where I wear these really bright green glasses. It's kind of all by happenstance. I'll give you the short version. I'm going to tell you the story just because I think it's the same. All of us are living the same movie. We're just different actors and actresses within that movie. And so don't do what I did, which is really resist my story for 15 years. So all of you just step into your story. Or if you already stepped into that story, that, that first level of discomfort, just step further into your story. Because long term, that's the most comfortable place that we all can live. But with the name like Eric Qualman, first initial, last name, Equal Man, I've been Equal Man my entire digital career because that's usually your email address. First initial, last name, all of a sudden you're Equal Man. And I honestly did not like it because, in fact, I hated it because you'd walk into a meeting and they're like, oh, Equal Man's here. And at first it's funny, but after a while it gets kind of old. Or, oh, we need coffee? Well, Equal Man must be super fast. He can probably get a superhero. Oh, we got to crunch those numbers for Wall Street over the weekend? Well, Equal Man's super strong. He can work the weekend. And then something that I realized that was happening, I always thought it was happening to me. And then a, a moment in time, I realized, wait, this is happening for me. And I was very fortunate for this to happen is that we're doing a magazine interview and they want to do a cover shot for that magazine. And they said, hey, you've got an interesting email address and website with Equal Man. Can we have some fun with it? Do you mind if we give you some Clark Kent like Superman glasses to wear? And I go, yeah, let's do that. And then they handed me some glasses and they go, do you mind if they're bright green? Because we have our St. Patrick's Day issue coming up. And I go, yeah, whatever, whatever helps, you know, happy to do it, have fun. And so they bring out the glasses. We take the photo. I don't think much of it. And then a couple of weeks later, I fly to Kenya to give a talk. And the night before I'm about to give that talk, I'm going to adopt a baby cheetah at a rescue shelter. You know, I'm not taking the cheetah home. My wife would kill me if I brought home a, a cheetah. But <laughs> It was just to find out more about Kenya and the beautiful people there and really entrench myself in the locality of it. And the way over, the lady that I'm with, she said, hey, you know, Usain Bolt, the Olympic sprinter, adopted from the same litter that you adopt from a couple of days ago. We filmed him. We'd like to film you and we can marry all this video together to help raise more money for the shelter. I go, yeah, that's great. That sounds like a really good idea. And then she pauses and looks at me. And I'll never forget this. And she goes, but... 
obviously when we're filming, we want to make sure you're wearing your green glasses. And I pause and look back at her and go, oh, I don't have green glasses with me. I'd look like an idiot walking around wearing green glasses all the time. And then I never want to see that look on anyone's face again, that look of disappointment. She goes, no, that's what everyone in Kenya thinks you look like is this person with green glasses. And so <laughs> all of a sudden I realized all this time I was saying, I can't believe I'm equal, man. When I should have said, I can't believe I'm equal, man. What a gift. You know, let's just yeah. jump into it. And if we can use kind of this fun stuff, whether they're green glasses, whether it's the name to kind of reach one more person, that it's worth me stepping into that discomfort of wearing these green glasses. And I won't bore your audience with all the instances that have happened since then. And that we now crazy enough, we sell like thousands of these green glasses when I go to events, because I want to have everyone in these green glasses to remind them to focus, to remind them to walk into discomfort. So I basically, I told you that story. Cause again, I think everyone, it's your story. You know, everyone out there, what I just told you, you have an exact, almost not exact, but you have, a version of that, that we are walking on different paths in the woods, but we're in the same woods. And so the reason I told that, and the reason I took so long to tell it was because I want you to step fully into your story because it's the uncomfortable at first. I'm still uncomfortable wearing green glasses, but it's the most uncomfortable place. It's the most comfortable place you can live long-term. Yeah. And the goal isn't to be like everybody else. The goal isn't to fit in. The goal is to differentiate ourselves and to set us set ourselves apart and to find our superpower, right? And you just found your one of your differentiators there. So you embraced it. I love it. Uh, before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about social nomics. Um, tell us a little bit about the story behind that and and maybe tell our audience some of the the key takeaways from that. Yeah, so my first book, Social Nomics, and a lot of people still to this day, which makes sense, they completely associate social media with social nomics, which inherently it's there, but let me explain what social nomics is at a six second level. Social nom, so all of us out there, whatever you're doing, trying to monetize, whether you're nonprofit, for profit, doesn't matter, is that your best customers, your best clients, your best partners, your best team members, your best employees all come from word of mouth. That's been true for thousands of years. The major shift that I saw 11, 12 years ago was that now that word of mouth is basically world of mouth or word of mouth is now on digital steroids. So now if I like something you do, instead of telling six people, I can tell 42, I can tell 4,200. And so it's really about word of mouth on digital steroids or word of mouth is now world of mouth. And so that's what social nomics is all about. It's how do I leverage these new communication tools and they're changing every, every day. Yeah. So it's not really the tool, it's more the trend you need to look for. And it's about technology changes every second, but human nature never does. It's okay, how do I take advantage of this word of mouth on digital steroids? Again, whether you're a church, whether you're for profit, whether you're a nonprofit, it doesn't matter. And so that's why I wrote the book Social Nomics, because at the time, most people saw this shift, but they thought the shift was just for teenagers. And so obviously everyone can see that now, but at the time when MySpace was dominant, so in social nomics, I'm saying, look, Facebook's better technology. It's probably going to take over MySpace. There's just a lot of stuff that's changed since then. A lot of stuff in the book came true, but still the core of the book hasn't happened yet. The core, there's a lot of stuff that's come true. Like I was fortunate that I didn't have cable because of this whole, I was basically in Boston and I, I at an apartment and my wife and I go, oh, I go, I just called Direct TV and they said they can't put it in this building because I got to go talk to Larry. And then I'm like, well, I have to talk to Larry to get this set up. And another moment where I'm like, I can't believe this is happening to me that this guy wants to charge me 700 bucks to get this set up. I'm not paying that just on principle. So I was one of the first people just to start live streaming. It was an awful experience, but I could see, wait, this is where the world's going to go. And so there's a lot of stuff in the book that's already happened. Like everyone's cutting the cord. They're going live stream. They're paying for packages. Uh, everyone's on social media. They understand that. I talk in the book that it's going to change the way we do politics. Everyone can see that actually to the extreme that it's affecting elections, sometimes in a nefarious fashion. But the main core of the book still hasn't happened. The main core is that I want to know what you've purchased easily. So we've seen a glimpse of it, but I want to know that, oh, Nathan just had a second kid and I had my second child and he bought this particular SUV. Oh, wait, my 40 other friends that have the same exact scenario, they bought one of these two SUVs. So now it 
eliminates all the research that I need to do. And so that's really the core of that word of mouth on digital steroids that whoever does it, it might be Facebook. It might be someone we don't even know is that when I do a search query, I don't want a list of paid ads and some random results that I have to click down to. I want the answer that my friends have already ferreted it out for me. If I'm trying to figure out how to write my last will and Testament, if 10 of my friends have already done that research, I want to know that if I just moved into yeah. town, I have 10 friends in that town and nine of them use the same dentist and love her. I want that dentist. And so that still hasn't happened. It's still the promise of social economics. What is your greatest home run that you've hit so far? I mean, outside of the kids, I'll, I'll say the greatest thing that we've been able to do is just be able to empower 50 million people. So spoken in 55 countries, just empowering the 50 million is a big number, but it's really the greatest thing I've ever done is when someone reaches out to me on an individual level, whether that's Katie or Jim, and they say, I saw you speak three years ago, or I read your book, or listened to your podcast, whatever it is that we're getting out there in terms of edutainment, is that they come back and say, it changed my life in a positive direction, that I then shifted and went in this direction, or I was going along the right path, and I just went deeper on it because of something that you put out there in the world. And so on those tough days, that keeps it going. You know, I, you should always do this. You should always keep a folder of some positive vibes that come to you, whether that's from a parent or whether that's from a customer or whatever it is, because the days, it's like a roller coaster life. So you just want to make sure you're on that trajectory long term up. But there's those days where you get those humps and those seasons. Uh, those can be sometimes years. And so it's really just saving that. And I do that, I make sure I save it because when I have that bad week, that bad month, or that I can pull on that as a resource. And so to me, that's always the greatest thing we've ever done is if, can we impact someone's life? I love that. That's great advice to have a, a file somewhere with testimonials, success stories that can help pick us up when we're having a, a down week in that, in that roller coaster. What's the biggest mistake or failure that you've, you've had in your career and, and what'd you learn from it? Man, I have so many kind of think through which one's the best for this audience. Um, the biggest one might have been, if you remember during all these Ponzi schemes or the big one, right? And he just passed away. Uh, if you look at that, it's really about Bernie Madoff. So if you look at Bernie Madoff, there's all these other smaller schemes that are very similar to that. And so a lot of my good friends are actually CFOs and now are CFOs or with the CFO, right? Sometimes they're CEOs, but a lot of my good friends that I grew up with or went to graduate school with, they're in the financial sector where I'm like this marketing guy. So I know the least about finance of the group. And so we got involved investing in this investment and it was great. I'm like, wow, this is cool. I can't believe I'm getting 15%. So I'd ask my friends like periodically, I'd go like, how are we getting 15%? It seems too good to be true. And then they'd had reasons why they would pay us 15% and not get the money from the bank. So I'm like, that seems logical. But then long story longer, I just finally said, this is, my dad said, it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. Let's get this money out of here and move on to the next thing. Well, they're like, That's hey, the checks really in the smart. mail, checks in the mail. And then long story longer, it turned out to be one of these Ponzi schemes. So unfortunately I was just going, gosh, I can't believe we're getting this biggest return. So I just kept putting most of my discretionary, our families, my wife and I were putting our discretionary income in there. And so all of a sudden, all of that nest egg went away. And yeah. it's right at the same time we're about to have our first child. And by the way, it's about the time that we're going to start our first business, this, what I'm doing now. And then also I somehow, well, I won't layer that in at this, but anyways, that was the biggest mistake, but it's also the best education. So I'd probably do it again because I learned a lot to where I'm like, why am I putting my money in other people? Why don't I put it back in myself? So whatever yeah. you do, that might be investing in your education. It might be investing in your company is I realized that, yeah, you want to have a spread out portfolio, but at the end of the day, I realized I get a greater return if I invest in what I'm doing. And so that was the biggest lesson that I learned. It was, it was a hard lesson because all your discretionary income goes to zero. The other lesson is that the best time to start your business was yesterday. The next best time is today. So I couldn't start our business at a worse time. We're in a recession, just lost all this discretionary income. Oh, by the way, there's another thing on why, uh, well, I won't get into it, but I got a false positive on lymphoma. So then I was starting to deal with that, which oh, mattered man. because all of a sudden we don't have 
insurance because we're coming off the company. This is before Obama made it. So if you have a pre-existing condition, but then that got fixed. But anyways, everything is like that storm. And I'm telling this because all of you have experienced that. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe all these things are hitting at once. And so just the lesson that it'll happen, you get through it and you, you can't see it in the moment because when you're inside that bottle, it's hard to read the label. Yeah. But man, looking back, it's like, wow, what a great education. One, invest in yourself. Two, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. And then three, the best time to start. There's never a perfect time to start what you want to do now. So the best time is yesterday. The next best time is today. So what does a company need to do now to leverage voice search? What should they be looking at? They should be looking at perfecting it. People don't use it because it's just not to the level that it needs to be, especially from a business standpoint. And as you work your way to perfection, you're never going to get to perfection. So you want to get to progress. So where can you get it so that it's actually usable? And so you think about Alexa, if you get it and it's there close to it, where you just say, Alexa, please reorder my same groceries from last week and have them delivered tomorrow. And so it's really about trying to recognize those voice patterns so that they actually, or they type out exactly what you say or correct it they have more artificial intelligence because this is kind of crude but i was like typing i was using voice the other day and i go yeah you know jill's great because she's a really fast putter we're talking about golf like this group text and i i had to read it back to me it's like jill's great because she's a really fast farter and so there needs to be artificial <laughs> intelligence in there well that might be inherently a positive i don't know but i'm like ah i gotta reread this whole thing again so with some simple yeah. artificial intelligence, you should be able to identify that quickly. It's like, obviously, this is in a business context, even though they're golfing, that they need to adjust that out of there. That can't be what the guy means. That's right. Takes me back and reminds me of those Star Trek days when Captain Kirk would always talk to the, the voice above to, for whatever he wanted. <laughs> well, we had one for autocorrect, too, that was funny. It didn't go out because I always make sure to you know, reread twice, send once, you know, the old, you know, measure twice, hammer once and social, it's like reread twice, send once. And I said, you know, if you get in here and kick ass, the world's your oyster, meaning that I don't have to give you a job description, just get in here and kick ass and you can set your own path. That's one of the beauties of being a small business. Yeah. But the autocorrect was if you get in here and kick, kiss ass, the world's your oyster. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, so it's still a little way to have the go same on autocorrect and the voice recognition. Thank you so much, Eric, for sharing your stories and insights with us today. Here are some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, the internet has changed how we use word of mouth. We may be able to reach substantially more people through it. Number two, we should use the things that are different about ourselves to stand out from everyone else. Number three, we can save testimonials for tough days when our spirits are low to help us get through the hard times. Number four, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Number five, we may be able to get a greater return on investment if we invest in ourselves rather than in others. Number six, the best time to start your business was yesterday. The next best time is today. Number seven, we may never reach perfection. And in my case, that's certainly true. But if we're constantly reaching for it, we can make constant progress. To learn more about or connect with Eric, you can connect with him on LinkedIn, visit his website at equalman.com or check out his books, uh, Socialnomics and The Focus Project. And you can find links to each of those sites in the blog post for this episode at monetizationnation.com. You can also get a free ebook about passion marketing and learn how to become a top priority of your ideal customers at passionmarketing.com. You can also subscribe to Monetization Nation on YouTube Instagram, Twitter, our Facebook group, and on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in your venture. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.